right? So when um, this meeting was started 10 years ago, um, it was, um, there were two basic ideas that motivated us to start the meeting. And one was um, to have um, a forum where people could exchange uh, techniques, uh, methods of analysis, and ideas uh, from uh, nervous systems uh, across different species. And uh, the other idea was to pay um, a, a serious attention to the actual circuits, the actual connectivity between neurons um, in, in, in your work. And I, you know, I, I think it uh, has been uh, really successful and it was a pleasure to see this time how many great talks there are and you know, how these ideas actually flourish. Um, and I, I should also say that um, when the meeting got started, uh, it was felt that uh, these ideas also were inspired uh, by the work of um, Larry Katz. Um, and so uh, very early on, um, it, we started a lecture, um, a Larry Katz lecture, um, that would, was given by um, a recent um, a PhD um, as decided by a committee that included the organizers of the meeting and um, uh, a couple of ad hoc people. Uh, so um, now um, we will um, have this um, lecture, but before that uh, we will have a couple of uh, introductory talks. And the first one uh, we will hear from a very, very close collaborator of uh, Larry Katz, um, uh, Doris uh, Yarich, who is a, a doctor of psychiatry. <laughs> Thanks. So it's not a talk by any means. I'm just going to make a few comments. And I, um, I <laughs> collaborated with Larry that I was his wife, which you, you all may not know at this point. Some people do. But, um, and Larry and I worked, we met in Torsten Weasel's lab um, many, many years ago. And so I briefly did some neuroscience research. But um, um, it's very moving for me to be here. Um, I did spend a weekend here uh, when Larry first came to Cold Spring Harbor for the course that he developed and um, ran. And um, okay, let me, <laughs> I was like, I can do this without any notes or anything like that. But um, I am very honored to um, be here presenting, um, being part of the presentation of the award for He Day today. And I've just heard a little bit about him and his work. Um, so I'm, I'm going to let Rafa introduce him. But I see many similar similarities between him and Larry. And so that's um, also very gratifying to me to be able to be here um, and see that the things that Larry really valued, which were a focus on um, the importance of the ideas and the interesting questions in science, is is continuing to be carried forward, especially in a time when I know there are increasing pressures, um, funding, and all kinds of um, more complex, I think, pressures on science than there were when Larry was rising up through the graduate school postdoc system. Um, but Larry was um, someone who really valued the big questions in science and also innovation. So technical innovation, creativity in the work, um, and he also really valued the relationships and always thought of science as a place um, where he had kind of his second family. He often talked about lineage within the scientific commu community and uh, viewed a lot of his teachers and his colleagues as part of his family. Um, he absolutely loved Caltech, which w was where he got his PhD. And uh, at Caltech, he worked with Mark Kanishi. And so that's another kind of, I think, nice connection with Hide, who tells me that he's also um, learned from Mark Kanishi and also, you know, comes from Japan like Mark. Larry became enamored of Japanese culture working with Mark and then had the opportunity to go to Japan multiple times in the course of work and we went there together several times. Um, so that's also kind of a nice uh, tr continuing the tradition, I think. Um, 
And he also, I think, believed in mentorship and paying it forward. Uh, when he had his own lab, he um, reached out to the younger members of his team and um, I think really uh, valued uh, helping to grow the next generation through personal connection and kind of um, treating um, students as equals and postdocs as equals. And I think that all that is reflected in the fact that the organizers of this award chose to give it to a younger um, rather than a more established scientist. I think that Larry would have really been thrilled by that. So um, thank you for uh, continuing the tradition. Thank you for um, having the award in the first place. And congratulations to Hide. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. So um, uh, I'm uh, Rafa Yuste, I was Larry's first grad student, and I'm going to introduce uh, Hide Nagaki, who's our awardee today. Uh, Hide comes from, uh, was uh, educated at the University of Tokyo, where he was uh, ranked number one uh, entering University of Tokyo, and he was the valedictorian of his class leaving University of Tokyo. He couldn't have done better there. And then he went to Caltech, where he did his PhD in the laboratory of David Anderson, uh, studying Drosophila and he focused his attention on the intrinsic persistent activity um, of, uh, of the Drosophila brain. And um, to put his work in, in context, uh, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, running through the center of Western uh, philosophy and Western thought is the um, tension between two views of the mind, or two views of the brain. One, which is the British empiricist and Hume and Locke, that view the brain as essentially or the mind as reflecting the world. On the other tradition, so this is more has to do with the philosophy of Kant, uh, view the world as reflecting the mind and make the emphasis on what's internally uh, driven in the, in, the, in the mind. And fast forward to 1924, where uh, Hans Berger applies for the first time the EG to the human brain, to his own brain, and he discovers that uh, as expected, uh, you have a lot of activity on your occipital cortex when your eyes are open and you're looking at the world, but the big discovery came when he closes his eyes and he fi and finds that there's as much activity <laughs> with the eyes closed as with the eyes open. So he discovers that the brain is intrinsically active. This persistent activity is a mystery to this day and runs through the middle of neural circuits because that could be probably the main function of many neural circuits is to generate this activity. So he depicted on this. Uh, in his PhD thesis, and he used Drosophila in a very, um, with a clever um, ingenuity of novel methods, in this case molecular methods, reflecting also pretty much the style that uh, Larry Katz uh, had in his science, which is by building new methods, you advance the, the field. Um, uh, he de, uh, used uh, a method called Tango to molecularly map the sites of the brain uh, where specific neuromodulators are uh, used, in this case is dopamine, and he found out how dopamine controls the perception of the taste by the flies, of the sweet taste in this case, to the point that you can actually complete change the sensitivity of the receptor neurons um, due to the, uh, the secretion of dopamine up in presynaptically. Uh, he dissected out those circuits and he manipulated them genetically to prove that there was in, indeed a causal effect. Uh, that led to a, a major paper. He didn't stop there. He also uh, uh, pursued uh, upstream regulators of this uh, neuromodulator pathway that controls other aspects of the persistent activity in the fly. In other words, the internal uh, mind, so to speak, state of the, of the animal when the animal is receiving sensory input, in this case, taste. Um, and this is a manuscript that's still uh, on, on under review. Uh, and uh, he kept busy, he did, did a couple of other pieces of work. Uh, one of them is using uh, REACH as an optogenetic tool in Drosophila. Uh, and uh, he was just telling me that he has yet another project that he hasn't uh, written up on uh, using a combination of optogenetics and, and imaging to uh, figure out uh, functional connectivity in the fly brain. So he uh, has a rich portfolio in his uh, very uh, early stage of his career of uh, discoveries, new techniques, uh, 
creativity, uh, and I think uh, those of us who knew Larry uh, um, would feel uh, that he would be a very proud winner of this award. He did. Congratulations. Thank you so much for a really nice introduction. And I would like to thank for the organizer of this conference to give me this honor to give a talk named after the scientist I really respect. And actually when I like, was taking the PhD, the graduate school like seven years ago, actually I was thinking of his lab. Unfortunately it was not possible. So that's why I ended up in Caltech, in David Anderson lab. And in Caltech, as you said, um, I was taking class of Mark Konisi and also because he's also Japanese, I also often visited his lab, and I have heard a lot about him, about Lolly, and he said that Lolly was really the best student of him, and he was so creative and also so ind independent that he started totally different projects from the other people in the lab and being super successful without like Mark being hands-on. So this gave me a good lesson to be independent during my PhD. And so with that, I want to start talking about my PhD project in Caltech in David Anderson lab. And it's basically about the neural mechanism of the state control in the fruit flies. Many animals, including fly, change their behavior depending on their internal states. For example, if there is a food in front of the flies, and if the flies are full, of course they will not eat it. But if the flies are hungry, they will eat. So this is a very simple example but this will clarify that even if we give exactly the same sensory input, animals show different behavior output depending on their internal state. And this will make the animal behavior adaptive depending on their internal requirements or the change in the environment. There are several important properties of the internal states. First, many of the states are multimodal. For example, in case of hunger, it increases the amount of feeding, but not only that, it enhances the sensitivity of the olfactory system or gustatory system toward the food so that they can easily find the food. Also at the same time, it increases the locomotion level so that they can find the food. And at the same time, these changes do not happen in like on and off manner, but it's more like gradual and a scalable change. And at the end, many of these effects of the internal states are persistent. In other words, once the animal is under some state, it will like, be under some state for a while. So during my PhD, I tried to understand the neural mechanism of these important properties of the internal state. So this is the outline of my talk today. So first, I'm going to talk about the method we developed to visualize where and when in the brain the neuromodulator is working because the neuromodulator is a quite important things working during the internal state. And by using this tool, we found that the dopaminergic moderation is important to degrade the change in the sugar sensitivity during hunger, and having that as an entry point, we identify several neuromodulatory pathway which degrade different aspect of the hunger-induced behaviors. And this will approach to some of the multimodal properties of the state control. And in the latter half of my talk, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. So I'm going to talk about the development of the optogenetics tools in the fly. So it was quite hard to use the channel rhodopsin in the flu flies, and the main reason is because the blue light cannot penetrate well the fly cuticle. But with the recent development of the red sifted opsins, we could make, it, make the optogenetics work in the flu flies, and by using that, we study the persistent activity of the fruit flies. For the internal state control, as I said, the neuromodulators are quite important. And these are mainly studied first by the very simple nervous system in the crayfish, crab, or lobsters. This simple nervous system is called stomatogastric ganglion, which is a ganglion which control the gut movement. And the number of neurons are different from species to species, but sometimes it's less than 10 neurons 
So it's quite simple nervous system with a really hardwired circuit. But something interesting here is people found that depending on the neural modulation, this simple circuit can have a really variety of different kind of output. So neural modulator can make a simple circuit to behave in different ways. And not only that, as you know, the neural modulator exists among across all the animal species, and including human, of course, and it's an important target for the many of the drugs of the psychiatric diseases. So altogether, neural modulator seems like it's important not only for the central pattern generator, like the stomatic gas, gas through ganglion, but also for the internal state and maybe emotion in the human. So this will give us a really nice entry point to study the state control. But it has been hard to study the neural modulator function in the fluke flies, the model system we are working on. And one of the reasons is because many of the neural modulator neurons project to a little blow area of the brain. And if you just manipulate the neural modulator neurons, it has a lot of effect. So it has been hard to study the function of the neural modulator for each different state. And there was no way to know where in the brain these, no, these neural modulators are working. So when I started my PhD, we decided to make a new tool to visualize where and when in the brain these neural modulators are working. And for that, we used the fact that most of the neural modulators use G protein coupled receptor or GPCR as a receptor. In principle, if we can monitor the activity of the neural modulator receptor, then we can tell how much of the neural modulators are working on the neurons. And for that, we use the Tango system developed by the Richard Axel lab um, six years ago. As the name implies, this system is consists of the two proteins. So as you can see here, the one is a G protein coupled receptor, in this case, for in this case dopamine receptor, fused with transcription factor, let's say, and there is a Teth protease Kribis site in the middle. And the other component is arestin bound with Teth protease. So when the ligand binds to a GPCR, in this case dopamine binds to dopamine receptor, it is known that there is a phosphorylation of the internal domain of the G protein coupled receptor, and this will include the arrestin to the GPCR. Basically, the function of the arrestin is to suppress the activity of the GPCR after its activation. But in this case, there is a Teth protease bound to this arrestin, so it will cut the previous side here. Then the Lex A is now free to move around, so it will enter into the nuclei to turn the expression of the reporterzine. So in this system, if you monitor the amount of the reporterzine expression, you can tell how much of the neural modulator or the ligand exists outside of the cell. So originally, this tangle system was developed for the cell culture system, but we wonder if this will work in vivo in the fry brain. So the basic idea is like this. Make the transgenic flies express this tangle system for each different neuromodulator receptor and put them under different state. And dissect the fly's brain later, then in principle, we should see a reproducing expression in the place where they got the neuromodulation during this certain state. And so this is just showing how the fly brain looks like when we express the tangle system for dopamine receptor all over the brain of the fly's brain. And basically it's showing the reporterizing expression in the pseudo color. The red is higher expression, the blue is lower expression. And left side is the control fly. So even without any manipulation, you can see some reporterizing expression with this system. And this can be due to the basal dopaminergic neurons activity or can be some leakage of the system. But what's important here is if we feed the fly with L-dopa to increase the amount of the dopamine all over the brain, then you see an increase in the reporterizing expression. And this increase can be suppressed if you feed the fly with dopamine receptor antagonists simultaneously. So clearly, there is a change in the reporterizing expression depending on the amount of the dopamine inside the brain. But what we are interested in is not the change in the dopamine amount in the brain caused by the drug feeding, but instead we are interested in the change in the dopaminergic modulation caused by the internal state. So we put this dopamine receptor tangle flies under many different conditions, and we found something interesting when we served the fly. So here again, we are looking at the leprotizing expression of the flies expressing the dopamine receptor tangle all over the brain, and this is the fed fly and this is the wet stir fly. 
wet starvation means that I stir the fly with water so that the fly will not dry out. And but what you can see here is there is some increase in the reporter gene expression in this area of the brain. This is a presynaptic terminal of the sugar sensing neurons. So if you quantify the reporter gene expression in this area, you see a statistically significant increase in the reporter gene expression. And if you feed a fly with dopamine receptor antagonists, there is no increase anymore. So this increase in the reporter gene expression is depending on the dopaminergic moderation. So altogether, it means that the starvation increases the dopaminergic moderation on the sugar sensory neurons. Then what's the function of this? I think you have some experience that when you're hungry, many things start tasting better. And one of the reasons for this is because there is a change in the gustator sensitivity when you're hungry. So we wonder if this is the case also for the fly. And it's quite easy to quantify the gustator sensitivity of the fruit flies. The assay is called proboscis extension reflex. So the thing we need to do is to mount the fly on the tube and present a drop of the sucrose solution to the labellum, the tongue of the fly. And if the fly detects the sugar inside this drop of the water, and if they want to drink it, then they will extend their proboscis, basically the mouth part of the fly, trying to drink it. So if we check the fraction of fly showing this PR response to each different concentration of the sucrose, we can accurately quantify the behavior sensitivity of the flies toward the sugar. So this is showing the result of the Y type flies. X axis is showing the sucrose concentration. And Y axis is showing the fraction of fly showing the response toward different concentration of the sucrose. So in case of the fed flies, you can see that the fly only responds to very high concentration of the sucrose, something like 400 millimolar. But if we stir the flies for one day and two days, you start seeing that the flies are responding to lower concentration of the sucrose. So this means that fly increases their sugar sensitivity during hunger. Interestingly, when we feed the fly with L-dopa to increase the amount of dopamine all over the brain of the fruit flies, we see something similar. Again, there's an increase in sugar sensitivity. And we can mimic this effect by also by some genetic manipulation to activate the dopaminergic neurons. So, so far I have a three independent finding. First, by using the Tango system, I found that the wet starvation increases the dopaminergic moderation on the sugar sensory neurons. And behaviorally, I found that wet starvation increases the sugar sensitivity. And also by behavior, we found that increase in the dopamine amount in the brain increases the sugar sensitivity. So combined together, it's possible that there is a simple pathway like this. Basically, if we serve the fly, there is a dopaminergic moderation on the sugar sensory neurons, which result in the increase in the sugar sensitivity. And to show this, what we need to do is basically block the dopaminergic moderation specifically on the sugar sensory neurons and to see if it will block the effect of the hunger to increase the sugar sensitivity. And because the fly has four different dopaminergic receptors, first thing we did is to extract the RNA from the sugar sensory neurons and did a qPCR to find which dopaminergic receptors are expressed in the sugar sensory neurons. Then we did a, a RNAi of these dopaminergic receptor to see if it blocks the effect of the hunger to increase the sugar sensitivity. So this is a control flies. As I showed you before, there's an increase in sugar sensitivity when we serve the fly. But if you suppress the expression of the dopecr, it's one of the dopaminergic receptor in the fruit flies, specifically in the sugar sensory neurons using 05 egg alpha driver, then you can suppress this increase in sugar sensitivity caused by the hunger. And what's also important here is not is also like there's no change in the basal sugar sensitivity between these control flies and the uh, RNI flies. So this dopecr is not necessary for the basal sugar sensitivity, but it's only required for the increase in sugar sensitivity caused by the hunger. So dopecr and sugar sensory neurons is necessary to increase the sugar sensitivity, and indeed this kind of pathway exists. So we next wonder what's the physiological mechanism of the dopamine to increase the sugar sensitivity. And first we saw it's possible that the dopamine will increase the firing rate of the sugar sensory neurons. So we, we did extracellular recording from the sugar sensory neurons, and 
present the sugar and see the firing rate. And we didn't see any difference in the firing rate comparing the fat and one day wester flies. So next we wonder if it's affecting the carcinogen influx at the presynaptic terminal of the sugar sensor neurons. To do this, what we did is basically functional carcinogen imaging by expressing GCAMP specifically in the sugar sensor neurons and monitor the carcinogen influx at the brain, at the presynaptic terminal of these sugar sensor neurons. And also presenting the sugar and see the carcinogen influx. As you can see here, when there is an increase in the sucralose presentation, then there is increase in the carcinogen influx in these neurons. These are shown by Christian Scott Klug, originally. So, if you compare the fed fly and stir fly, actually there is an interesting difference. If you stir the fly, there's an increase in this sugar-dependent carcinogen influx. So hunger does affect the carcinogen influx in the sugar-sensing neurons. And also importantly, if we add the dopamine directly to the brain, just by adding to the bass, then there's also increase in the carcinogen influx, both at the basal level and also the carcinogen influx caused by the sugar stimulus. And this increase in carcinogen influx can be blocked if we block the expression of the dopcr in these sugar sensory neurons. So dopcr in the sugar sensory neurons is required for this dopamine dependent increase in the carcinogen influx. To summarize the results so far, so fly detect the sugar by using their sugar sensory neurons and trigger the feeding behavior, PR. But if the flies are starved, there is an increase in the dopaminergic moderation on the sugar sensory neurons, which increases the carcinogen influx. So even if we give exactly the same sugar concentration, there is an increase in the feeding response. And when we published the paper, also there was a very nice paper from the Christian Scott lab describing that there is a one dopaminergic neurons in the fly brain which increases its activity during hunger. So it's likely that that's the upstream neurons which is moderating the sugar sensory neurons. And at the same time, we wonder what's the upstream of these dopaminergic neurons. It's possible that it's this dopaminergic neuron actually sense the hunger, like, like the sugar concentration in the hemolymph and increase the firing rate. Or it's possible that there's another neurons at the upstream. So to check this, we screen for the neural modulators in the fluid fly, basically by checking the mutant of the many of the neural peptides exist in the fluid flies. And we found something interesting when we manipulate the neural peptide F or MPF in the fluid flies. MPF is an ocelog of the MPY. And Leslie mentioned about this peptide yesterday, so I don't have to describe the detail, but basically this peptide ocelog exists among the animal kingdom. And in many of the cases, this protein is important for the feeding control. So when we activate this MPF neurons by using triple one, then there was an increase in the sugar sensitivity, mimicking the effect of the hunger. On the other hand, when we suppress these MPF neurons by using genetic tool, there is something opposite happened. So this is again the control flies, increase the sugar sensitivity during hunger, but if we block the activity of the MPF neurons by using USKIR, which is the rectifying potassium channel, then we can block the hunger effect to increase the sugar sensitivity. So interestingly, the direction of the chains of the MPF manipulation is quite similar to the manipulation we did for dopamine. Basically, when we activate the MPF, there's an increase in sugar sensitivity. And if we block, then there is a decrease in sugar sensitivity. And the same thing for dopamine. So we wonder if this MPF is in the same pathway as a dopamine to control the sugar sensitivity. And because dopamine directly moderates the sugar sensory neurons as the final target of the neural moderation, it's likely that MPF exists at the upstream of this dopaminergic neuron. And to show this, we did something similar to the epistasis experiments which people do for the genetics. So what we did is to activate the MPF neurons and simultaneously block the dopaminergic system and to see if we can block the change in the sugar sensitivity. So when we activate the MPF neurons, as I showed before, there is an increase in the sugar sensitivity. But if we combine this manipulation, with the dopcr mutant, which is required for the change in the sugar sensitivity during hunger, we can block this increase in sugar sensitivity caused by the activation of the MPF neurons. 
On the other hand, if we activate the dopaminergic system and block the MTF neurons, then there is no change, there is no effects. So this implies that basically MTF neuron is the upstream of the dopaminergic system to control the supersensory neurons. So tangle map enables the visualization of the modulation caused by the state changes. And by using this tool, we identify neural modulatory pathway regulating the sugar sensitivity during hunger. And as a result of this moderation, hungry flies become less selective in the food choice. So after we find this, we wonder if this pathway we identify is also affecting the many different other hunger in these behaviors in the food flies. As I said in the first part, fly change a lot of different behaviors during hunger. So if this is the only pathway which is representing hunger in the food fly, this should affect all the other aspects of the behavior changes. So to test if this is the case or not, we try to search, first of all, if the hunger affect any other taste modality in the food flies, and if this pathway affects that change. As David from the Christian Scott lab described yesterday, fly can detect sugar, bitter, water, CO2, and pheromones. And we wonder first if the bitter is moderated by the hunger. So as I show you at the beginning, basically during the starvation, there is an increase in the sugar sensitivity. And we wanted to test the change in the bitter sensitivity during hunger. And to check the bitter sensitivity during hunger, what we did is quite similar to the PER experiments we did for the sugar sensitivity. But what we need to do is to mix the bitter into the high concentration of the sugar and to see how strongly bitter suppress the feeding. Basically, bitter compounds is a toxic molecule. So if the fly detect the bitter compound, they stop eating. So whenever flies detect the bitter, they suppress the PER. So this is how the data looks like. So x-axis is showing the bitter concentration, which I mix into the high concentration, concentration of the sucrose. And y-axis is showing the fluctuation of flies, which did not show the PER. So if this score is higher, it means that fly detected the bitter. So in case of the fat flies, actually they are super sensitive to the bitter, in this case lobeline. They can detect the lobeline as low as like 0.1 millimolar. But if we stir the fly for one day and two days, they stop caring about the bitter, and they eat even if there is a mixture of the 10 millimolar of the lobeline. So this means that there is a decrease in the bitter sensitivity during hunger. So in opposite to the increase in sugar sensitivity, bitter sensitivity decreases. But there is a caveat here. In this assay, we mix the bitter into the sucrose. And I also say that there is an increase in sugar sensitivity. So this behavior change, which looks like there is a decrease in bitter sensitivity, can be caused by the masking effect of the increase in sugar sensitivity. So to exclude this possibility, what we did is to mix the bitter into the normalized concentration of the sugar, which triggered the same amount of the feeding response. In other words, the 400 millimolar of the sucrose trigger 70% of the response in the fat fly, and the 200 millimolar sucrose do the same thing for the one-day wester fly, and 100 millimolar sucrose do the same thing for the two-day wester flies. So basically, we mix the bitter into this concentration of the sugar and see what will happen. And even if we normalize the sugar concentration like this, there is a still decrease in the bitters. We can still observe the decrease in the bitter sensitivity during hunger. So this means that behavior bitter sensitivity decreases independently from the increase in sugar sensitivity during hunger. We also did a different, totally different assay to detect the bitter sensitivity. When we present a very high concentration of the lower line, like something like higher than one millimolar, they basically regurgitate the bitter compound. So also by using this method, we found that there is a decrease in the bitter sensitivity during hunger. And the, there is another difference we can find between the change in the sugar and bitter sensitivity during hunger. It's not only the different direction, but also the kinetics is different. So here I'm showing the kinetics of the sugar sensitivity changes during hunger. X-axis is showing the starvation duration and y-axis is showing the sugar sensitivity. Basically, it's the concentration of the sugar which will trigger the feeding response in 50% of the flies. So what you can see here is there's a big increase in the sugar sensitivity in the first six hours, 
And after that, the change is very gradual. So the biggest change happens at the early phase of the hunger or starvation. On the other hand, in case of the bitter sensitivity, as you can see here, there is no big change in the first 12 hours. But the change happens at the later phase of the starvation. So the kinetics of the change in the sugar and bitter sensitivity are different. So this implies that, well, there's several possibilities here. It's possible that these sugar and bitter sensitivity changes during hunger are moderated by different pathway, or it's also possible that it's controlled by the same pathway, but having different threshold for the upstream neural moderation. So to answer that, we wonder if this MPF or dopaminergic pathway which control the sugar sensitivity during starvation is also affecting the bitter sensitivity. And basically we activate or inhibit the dopaminergic system or activate or inhibit the MPF system and we have more data on here. We try many different methods but in none of the cases we see any effect on the bitter sensitivity. So this means that this pathway this control the sugar sensitivity is not affecting or controlling the visual sensitivity during hunger. So there should be something else which is moderating the visual sensitivity. So again, we performed screening for the neuromodulators in the fruit flies, and we found something interesting when we manipulated SMPF. So the name sounds quite similar to MPF, but it's different gene and at the different locus. So Compared to white flies here, the SMPF mutant fly, heterozygous or homozygous mutant flies, do not have any change in the bitter sensitivity if the flies are fed. So this means that this mutant does not affect the basal bitter sensitivity or bitter sensing machinery. However, when we serve the fly, there is a decrease in bitter sensitivity in the white type fly, which is shown in blue, but this effect is suppressed in this mutant. So this means that SMPF is necessary for the decrease in bitter sensitivity during hunger. Also importantly, if we rescue the expression of the SMPF in the part of the SMPF expression neurons in the brain, then we can rescue this effect to decrease the bitter sensitivity during hunger. And we can rescue this with several different graph lines so we could identify that these neurons, which are called DLP neurons, at the posterior side of the brain is basically releasing the SMPF to degrade the bitter sensitivity. So this data shows that SMPF is necessary and its rescue is sufficient for the control of the bitter sensitivity during hunger. And I'm not showing data here, but I have to say it's quite important to say that SMPF manipulation, which I'm showing here, do not affect the sugar sensitivity at all. So this means that there is a neuromodulator which only regulates the bitter sensitivity but does not affect the sugar sensitivity. Then how about its receptor? So the receptor of the SMPF is called SMPFR or SMPF receptor. So first we overexpress this receptor in a pan-neuronal manner. Then as you can see here, there is an enhancement of the change in the visual sensitivity during hunger. On the other hand, if we suppress the expression of this SMPF receptor in a pan-neuronal manner, then there is a suppression of the change in the bitter sensitivity during hunger. But again, it does not affect the bitter sensitivity during the fed state, so it's not affecting the basal bitter sensitivity. So SMPF receptor is necessary and sufficient for the bitter sensitivity change during hunger. And again, this receptor manipulation does not affect the sugar sensitivity. So there's a nice independent pathway here. And in case of the sugar sensitivity controlling pathway, the final target of the moderation was the sugar sensor neurons. And people have found a lot of nice examples that the internal states control the behavior by moderating the sensor neurons. Because it's the first place where the animal gets the signal and there is no mixture of the other information, so it's kind of nice place to do the moderation. So we wonder if it's the same thing for the bitter sensing pathway, if this SMPF pathway is regulating the bitter sensor neurons. To test if it, this is true or not, again, we perform a cursor imaging in the bitter sensing neurons this time. So we express GCAMP in the bitter sensing neurons by using 066 GAFOR from the Christine Scott lab and perform a similar experiment as I did before. Basically, I, I apply the lobe line to the tongue of the fly 
and sees that there is an increase in the corresponding influx in response to lobby line. And if I start the flight for two days, what we saw is actually there is a decrease in the corresponding influx caused by the lobby line stimulation. And this matches with the result of the behavior experiment. Behaviorally, what we found is during starvation, there is a decrease in the visual sensitivity. So this decrease in the corresponding influx in the visual sensing neurons can, ex can explain the behavior change we found during the hunger. And so we next wonder if this effect of the decrease in corresponding influx is caused by the SMPF neuromodulation. So to do that, basically we combine this corresponding imaging with the SMPF mutant. Then nicely, we don't see any change caused by the hunger anymore. So this means that this SMPF, SMPF receptor pathway is regulating the visual sensing neurons. However, unfortunately, we couldn't find any evidence that this SMPF receptor is expressed in the visual sensing neurons. We performed the qPCR, and we also did the overexpression and RNAi of this SMPF receptor, specifically in the visual sensing neurons, but there was no behavior phenotype. So it's likely that there's another neuron in the middle which regulate the visual sensing neurons at the end. And actually, we found that the SMPF receptor is expressed in the B-GAT neurons, basically the GABERSIC neurons. So the likely scenario here is that there is a GABERSIC neurons which suppress the visual sensing neurons during hunger, and it's regulated by this SMPF modulation. So at the end of this project, we wonder what's the interceptor receptor for these two pathways. Basically, the brain needs to know if the animal is hungry or not, and there's still ways to do that. Um, so it's possible for flies to detect the change in the sugar concentration in the blood or hemolymph, or it's also possible for them to detect the change in the gut size, or also possible they detect the amount of the hormone in the blood, like in the mammals. And people have identified a lot of interceptive receptors in the fluid flies in the last several years, so we tr wonder if any of them are at the upstream of these pathways, and if they're different between the sugar and bitter signal pathway, or if they're the same. So again, we did some screening, and we found something interesting when we manipulate the AK8 expressing neuroendocrine cell. So this is a neuroendocrine cell which expresses a neuropeptide, which is called AK8. But this cell is also known as the interceptive neurons. Basically, this cell express ATP-dependent ATP dependent potassium channel, sorry. And depending on the amount of the hemolymph sugar, it changes its corresponding influx amount and release different level of the AK8s. So when we kill this neuron using a US hit, then we can block the change in bitter sensitivity during hunger. On the other hand, if we activate this neuron by using triple one, then we can enhance the change in the visual sensitivity. So it's quite similar to the manipulation we did to the SMPF. The phenotype is similar. So AKS signal is necessary for the visual sensitivity change during hunger, but it doesn't affect the visual sensitivity in the fed state. So it means that it's not affecting the visual sensing pathway per se. And activation of the AKS signal is sufficient to decrease the visual sensitivity. And also importantly, AKA signal does not affect sugar sensitivity. So because the phenotype is quite similar to that of the SMPF, we wonder, again, if this AKA and SMPF are in the same pathway. So we perform the epistasis experiments, again, by activating the AKA and block the SMPF simultaneously. So to do that, basically, we activate the AKA with triple one and combine with the SMPF mutant then we can actually block the change in visual sensitivity caused by the AKA's activation. So this implies that this AKA neurons is the upstream of this SMPF neuropeptide. So with all this evidence so far, I found that there is a two different pathways which regulate the sugar sensitivity or visual sensitivity during hunger. And just to remind you, the kinetics of the change in the sugar sensitivity and bitter sensitivity was also different. So from all the level, from the kinetics and also the interceptor receptors and the neuromodulator and the final target of the neuromodulation, which is sensory neurons, at all the level, these two pathways are totally independent. And at the end, these two changes are merged together to trigger a less selective feeding in the fluid flies during the starvation. 
And there's an interesting implication here. So people have found that AKH neurons is necessary for the increase in locomotion during hunger. And basically, if you kill the AKH neurons, there is no increase caused by the, no increase in locomotion caused by the hunger. And interestingly, this effect happens at the later phase of the starvation, similar to the effect of the hunger to change the visitor sensitivity. On the other hand, people have found that both MPF and dopamine is working to increase the food-related learning and also the feeding amount during hunger. And again, interestingly, these, all these changes happen at the very early phase of the hunger, like six hours. And if you think about these changes, the change happens here or not the risky, like increase the serious sensitivity or food-related learning doesn't kill the fly. Maybe if you eat too much, it can explode your gut, but it's not too bad, I think. So these are like kind of nice chains to happen at the early phase of hunger so that you can increase the chance to find the food. On the other hand, these changes are really bad or risky because if you decrease the visitor sensitivity, there is a higher chance to eat something toxic. So, and basically fly can die for that. Also increasing the locomotion level is also quite risky because it's possible that fly will move out around two months and just die before they find the food. So it's possible, of course, it's hard to find the evidence for this, but the fly evolved a two independent pathway which regulate the low risk pathway, low risk can change it at the early phase of the starvation, and they also develop the other pathway which recruit the higher risk changes at the very end or at the later phase of the hunger when the flies do not have any other choice in their behavior choices. So if you say just hunger, it seems like just it's a one state, but actually, at least in case of flies, there are totally parallel pathway which regulate the different aspect of the hunger in these behaviors. So we found that the hunger moderates sugar and bitter sensitivity in opposite directions in an independent manner and with different kinetics. And we identify that two independent neuromoderator pathway is regulating these. So, and I want to move to the second part of my talk. And again, it's a little bit different. So in fruit flies, it has been quite hard to do the optogenetics. Actually, um, people have used a P2X2 to activate the neurons. But except for that, people couldn't use the thermodopsin in the fruit flies. And the main reason is, as you can see here, we cannot insert the optic fiber to the fly brain. Basically, we can insert, but if we do it, the fly will die. So that's one of the reasons. And also, basically, the blue light doesn't penetrate the fly cuticle well. So here, what I did is actually I insert optic fiber to the fly brain. But, and, but measuring the penetrance of the light through the fly cuticle, as you can see here, the red light penetrates much better compared to the blue light. So it's the similar thing for the mammal tissue. And we wonder if the red sifted thermodopsin will work to activate the neurons in the fly brain. And this reads developed by the Walter Chen's lab and by also by John Ling in his lab was very really nice. First, because it's red sifted, and secondary, because it has a really long off kinetics. As Ed Boyden described in, on the first day of this conference, basically the long off kinetics usually means that there's a bigger amount of the photocurrent. And also, reads has a very nice expression in trafficking both in fly and mice. So we tried to use this in the fly, we made a transgenic flies, and basically we class it to different graphical lines to see if the red light can trigger the behavior. So uh, we developed a high throughput LED-based optogenetic system. Basically, we shine the fly with a very high power red LED, and because the flies do not see well the red light, we can shine the light to the whole fly. And well, actually, flies still see a blue, uh, red light, but it's much less than blue and green. So hopefully, we hope that it doesn't affect the behavior so much. But anyway, this is how we do experiments. And to make a long story short, the reads work to activate the neurons. So I'm just going to show some example. First, we express the reads in the sugar sensor neurons. And we basically pulse the light. And this is just indicating light where I show when the light is on. Basically, they think the light is sweet, so they keep showing this PR response to the light. 
and they keep this behavior more than five minutes if I keep pulsing. And now I express the reads into the motor neurons. Then they start this kind of cloud block. So clearly, this reads system works quite well in the fruit flies to activate the neurons in the central nervous system. So this gives us a really good opportunity to study the persistent activity. Because before reads, the way to activate the neurons, the, the popular way to activate the neurons in the fruit fly field was using the triplet one. But this doesn't have a really nice temporal resolution. So it has been hard to see the effect of the activation of the neurons and if the activation of the neuron is having a persistent effect. So we tried to find such a thing by using this reads in the fruit flies. And persistent activity, is, as the name implies, is a sustained neural activity in the absence of the external input. And it has been studied a lot in the context of the short-term memory, decision-making, integration of the signal, and motor control. And for example, if we give two different stimulus, A and B, with some interval, the monkey, in this case, need to keep the information about the stimulus A. And indeed, people have found the neurons which have uh, some neural correlate of the first stimulus. However, people have found a lot of these kind of the persistent activity in the fruit flies, but the neural mechanism of this kind of persistent activity is still unknown for the most part. So it would be nice if we can find the persistent behavior activity in the fruit flies because of the lot of genetic tools in the fruit fly, it should be easier to answer the question. And we wonder if there's any persistent activity related to the corset. So the reason is this. So during the course of behavior of the fruit flies, male fly first touch the female. And this is because they have the pheromone sensing neurons on their leg, and basically it's a gustatory cue. So first thing they need to do is to integrate the information about the cuticle pheromone of the female to know if it's a conspecific animal and if it's female or male. And they need to accumulate the information to make a decision to do the corset. So for this kind of integration, first persistent activity can be useful. And also once they decide to do the courting, they start doing the chasing and singing behavior. And meanwhile, they do those kind of behavior, they do not necessarily keep touching the female anymore. So somehow they need to keep information about the other animal. And at the end, they will do cooperation. But if they don't have the persistent activity, it's possible that male forget about the other fly and they cannot do the cooperation. So we try to activate the neurons which are important for the course of behavior in the fruit flies. And Barry Dixon group have identified two important neurons which trigger the wing extension, the singing behavior which happens during the course of. One is called P1 neurons which exist inside the brain, and the other is called PIP10 neurons which is a downstream of these P1 neurons and transmit the signal from the brain to the ventral nerve cord. And this is how the behavior looks like when we activate these neurons. So the left side is the P1 reads fly, and this is control. When we activate these neurons, there is a singing behavior, like the white tie fly singing behavior. But when we activate the PIP10 neurons, the same thing happens, actually. So it triggers a singing behavior, but it's a little bit different from the P1 activated singing behavior. And when we see the kinetics of this singing, it's quite different between the P1 and PIP10 activation. So when we activate the PIP10 neurons, here I'm showing that the green box is showing when the light is on, but basically the flies show the wing extension, which is literally time lock to the light stimulus. So it's more like a command neuron. Whenever this neuron is activated, they show the singing behavior. On the other hand, when we activate the P1 neurons, it's strikingly really different. So again, this green box shows when the light is on, but they do not show the singing behavior just after the light is on, but the starting on the behavior is near stochastic. And also at the same time, there is a near short bout of the singing, which is quite similar to the natural singing behavior. And also importantly at the end, they show a very long persistent singing behavior even after the light is off. And these different property of the P1 and PIP10 neurons are not because of the difference in the sensitivity of the P1 and PIP10 neurons. Um, if you just measure the light intensity and the behavior curve, then there is no difference in the light sensitivity between the P1 and PIP10 neurons. So this means that these are different property of the two neurons. So activation of the P1 neurons triggers stochastic and persistent wing extension. 
And this persistent activity is amazingly long lasting. Sometimes it lasts more than 10 minutes. And also importantly, this persistent behavior happens without any other fly in front. So it happens with single fly in dark. So it doesn't require any social feedback and it's autonomous. So the fly somehow keeps the information inside your brain. So we still don't have answer for this, but this is a kind of good model system to answer the mechanism of the persistent activity. So we try to close the mechanism of this. And we can think of like two big different possibility. First, it's possible that P1 neurons keep the information by some kind of recurrent system, or it's also possible that P1 will project to the other neuron or other circuit where they keep the information. To distinguish this, we perform several experiments, and one of them is to perform carcinoma imaging of these P1 neurons while we are activating this neuron. So we express both reads and GCAM in these P1 neurons and observe what will happen when we activate this neuron. And to do those kind of all optical flows, of course the problem is there can be a, some of the cross leak of the light. But basically we solve this problem by using several, the several band pass filter and also try to use as weak light as possible. So this is how the setup looks like. And when we do not have the reads expressed in the P1 neurons, and if we only have the GCAMP expressed, then the response is quite flat. Basically, the light stimulation does not affect the signal. But if we express the reads together, then it looks like this. Basically, whenever we activate, we give the amber light or red light, then there is an increase in curve influx. But importantly, there is no persistent activity which we can monitor after the light is off. Of course, there are several caveats here. First thing is just this is just cursing imaging, so it's possible that the information is stored in different way, which is not affecting the cursing signal. And also, the other problem is actually the two photon ex excitation light to activate the GCAMP does activate the reads for some extent, so this can cause some artifact. But at least this supports the idea that it's not P1 neuron which keeps the information. So to test the second possibility, what we are doing now is basically doing a kind of similar experiment. So in this case, we express the P1 neurons by expressing reads in these P1 neurons, but express the camp in all the other neurons in the brain and try to find if there is any single neuron which shows the persistent activity after the activation of the P1 neuron. And it's still at the preliminary phase, so I cannot show the data, but we're still finding several interesting neurons which show the persistent activity after the P1 activation. So we want to find the graph one which level these neurons and manipulate them to answer if these neurons are really required for the persistent behavioral activity. So with that, I want to summarize the result. So we found that reads can be used to activate neurons in behaving flies, and activation of the reads can be combined with the GCAMP imaging, and this can be used for many purposes, but also useful to map the functional connection between neurons, as many people showed yesterday. And persistent course of behavior can be triggered by activating a single class of neurons. So with that, I would like to thank to my great mentor, David Anderson, None of this work could have been possible without being in his lab, so I really appreciate him. And I also need to thanks to the, my collaborator, Jan, who was a graduate student in the Anderson lab, who worked with me for the RIS project. And also there are several undergrad who worked with me for the feeding project. And also I have a lot of nice collaborators for this project, and many, many other people for the reagent and collaboration and committee members and the funding and the scholarship. And there is another important person I need to acknowledge. So this is the welcome board for my wedding reception. But as you can see here, actually the date of my wedding was just three days before this wedding. Uh, I mean this conference, sorry. So my wedding was three days before this conference. So first I learned about these flies. Of course I was happy, but one second after I saw the schedule is very tight. And <laughs> secondary, I wonder about my honeymoon. <laughs> and cold spring harbor, it doesn't sound a good place to visit during spring. So, and well, basically I apologize to my wife and decide to have a honeymoon much later. But she was always, I mean, she is always patient. And I need to thanks to her at the end. And 
Thanks, everyone, to stay here at the end. I'm happy to have questions. Questions? Um, how, I have a question about Tango. Uh-huh. Yeah. How generalizable is this technique? Can you apply that to any GPCR or? Uh -huh. And so how, how, how fast is it? So we measure the speed of this system. So the way we do this is to turn on the Tango expression using the gene switch system by feeding the fly the RU46 and make them this, exp I mean, the induce this expression of the Tango and put them under some state and monitor the change of the gene expression a day later. So the temporal window to monitor the neural modulation is something like six to 12 hours. So it's quite long. So this can be only used for uh, near long lasting states such as hunger. So that's why we study hunger or like several other like long lasting state. And for the, if the tango can be used for other receptor, yes, um, I mean, uh, in the original tango paper, they apply it for many different GPCR and it works well. But if, we, if you want to use it in vivo, you want to have a very high signal to noise ratio. And that's a little bit more challenging than used in the cell culture. So we tried to make it for dopamine receptor and octopamine receptor and it works, but for the cell to nursing receptor, none of them were having a nice signal to noise ratio, so we, we never made it in vivo. So yeah, we still need uh, some modification and make it easier to use. Yep. Lovely talk. So I have a question about the last part. Did you try uh, activating the P1 and then looking for persistent activity in the P10, mm -hmm. which you would expect to see, right? Yeah, yes. Um, unfortunately, it's quite hard to identify the PIP10 neurons just based on their anatomical expression. We want to use specific GERFO lines. And for that reason, we need to combine all the GAFO lines together, and we haven't done it. But of course, yes, it's in the pipeline, and we need to do it. Mm. Actually, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, 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 uh, in the first part of your talk, you talk about the AKH neurons that are important for the later stage of the modulation during the hunger. So, so AKH is the counterpart of the glucagon in, in humans, which yeah. is important for mobilizing the, the storage, um, of the fly. storage uh, sugar of the flies. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm wondering, so at what time scale the storage sugar get used after the starvation of the flies? Um, sorry, I don't know the answer for that. Because is that yeah. the time window that when the AK, because uh, according to the model, it seems that AKH mm -hmm. neurons are not activated early stage, mm -hmm. but the later stage, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so well, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering why the flies didn't choose to activate these neurons to use the storage sugar first, and why these neurons are activated at the later stage? I mean, that's, that, that's the time when the storage sugar get used. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, well, it, it's possible that AKS neurons are activated much earlier to work on the fat cell, mm -hmm. and just the neurons have a different receptor or different sensitivity for the AKS signal, so that it's recruited later. So this kind of mechanism is something we can think of. So now with that, that we have the reads and the GCAM combination, we can study a lot of the kinetics of this neuromodulator pathway, which we identify, I think. Yeah. Is there any crosstalk between sugar sensory neurons and the bitter sensory neurons? Yes, there are a lot of crosstalk. So people have identified several levels of the crosstalk, even at the sensory neurons level. So the first mechanism is because the sugar sensory neurons and bitter sensory neurons is at the base of the gastritis sensilla, it's very likely, well actually this is not something people show, show in the gastritis system, but in the olfactory system, people have shown that if you activate one of the neurons at the base of the sensilla, it affects the other neurons, basically by using up the ion in that small environment. There's an increased change in the potassium concentration, so it affects the other neurons. And also, it's known that there is a olfactory binding protein, family proteins, which will bind to the bitter and affect the sugar neurons. And also, I think it's possible that there is some interaction at the presynaptic terminal in the brain. So there are a lot of interaction between the sugar and bitter sensing neurons.
think. It's both potentiation and inhibition, or it's just inhibition? Uh, well, according to the talk of David from the Christian Scott Lab, it seems like it's more like an inhibition of each other. And indeed, like the mechanism I described is all inhibition between the sugar and bitter sensing neurons. Do you think it's possible to somehow blocking the NFP and the DA pathway mm -hmm. to treat obesity or help girls to lose weight? <laughs> ah, sorry, what's the question? <laughs> I mean, do you think it's possible to uh -huh. block the N NFP pathway uh -huh. uh, to help treat like uh, obesity or help girls lose weight? <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, the uh, first century, the way MPF works is different from between animal to animal. But yeah, uh, one thing we saw is maybe this high risky pathway is a good candidate for the pest control because many of the annoying, the feeding behavior of the insects are those kind of high risk behavior I saw. But yeah, I don't know. According to Laser Boschel, like the way SMPF works is quite different in mosquito. So yeah. <laughs> There can be a lot of species different. All right. Thank you very much okay. for a great Thank talk. You.